watching Over the Edge from Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. And we're back with Dr. David Kipping. Now, you mentioned Type M red dwarfs, and um, these are, you know, it's very, very small stars. And the un unfortunate reality of them is that their habitable zone has to be really close to the star, mm -hmm. which starts introducing things like tidal locking, such as with the TRAPPIST-1 planets and things like that. It does not seem to be ideal because it's probably bathing those planets in ultraviolet light. So as you said, even if you see oxygen, you can't quite pin it down to a biosphere. But when you start moving out and you start getting into bigger stars, stars like the, uh, I believe they're Type K orange dwarfs, mm -hmm. where it's a little bit further out. Does how does that change that? Is or is that a better place to look for um, for a possibly you know biosphere on an exoplanet? It's a it's a probably a better place bio. I mean, essentially, the closer you are to the Earth and the Sun, the better you are because that's the only example we know for sure is capable of supporting life. So either direction you go away from the Sun you become less and less certain about the, the possibilities. In either direction you go, you can think of possible objections as to why life would not be possible on, around those types of stars. So, I mean, this is kind of getting to the rare Earth hypothesis idea that maybe only truly sun-like stars with truly Earth-like planets, with truly moon-like moons, et cetera, et cetera, can, can be capable of life. And the more you diverge away from the Earth, you can always in invoke arguments. So K dwarfs are, you know, more similar to the sun, um, than certainly these very small M dwarfs like Trappist 1 are. Of course, that comes at a cost. It comes at the cost that they are larger than their M dwarf counterparts, and therefore our ability to detect biosignatures will be diminished. So, unless we were very, very lucky and the nearest K dwarf had an Earth like planet smack bang in the Hadro Zone that also happened to be transiting maybe then it would it would beat out the the next best m dwarf but chances are that the best m dwarf with a transiting planet will be far easier for us to make the measurement than the, than the best k dwarf just because of the abundance of these m dwarfs their proximity and the great gain that you get in their smaller sizes in terms of the our ability to make these measurements so uh you might be right you might be right that it is k dwarfs that are better but it's more challenging for us from an experimental perspective to actually determine that. And in many ways, it's, it's kind of the K-dwarfs are getting the, the shorthand of the deck because there's all this focus on M-dwarfs with the transit method for the reasons I described, because they, when they transit the star, you get a huge boost in the sensitivity if the, if the star is smaller. On the other hand, the direct imaging folks are not interested in M-dwarfs at all because the habitable zone is so close to that star it's not possible to block out the starlight effectively enough to image Earth-like planets around M dwarf. So if you, wanted to, if you want to directly image planets, it really has to be a planet which is quite far away from its star. And if you want it to be a habitable zone planet, then it means you're looking at a sun-like star. So the sun-like stars are getting the attention from the direct imaged folks. The transiting folks are interested in the M dwarfs, and the K dwarfs are kind of sat in this um, no man's land where uh, there really there really aren't much m many missions being planned that are focused on looking for Earth-like planets around them because they they do not represent a sweet spot for any type of measurement. So that's uh, back when people were were talking about KSE eight four six two eight five two with it, you know, possibilities of maybe there's a chance it could be you know an alien megastructure. The problem was one of the problems anyway was that the type F star? So it's not going to live anywhere near as long as our sun. So you have to ask the question, how could anything evolve to intelligence around a star like that? Yeah. But it may be that the answer... Which is one of Sagan's arguments as well in the past. He would often uh, point that out, that, you know, Carl Sagan said that you know, the F-type stars are probably not going to be useful for, for life. And that has guided us actually a lot since that, since uh, he wrote about that and, and other people as well. Yeah, it's it, it just... It's an unanswered question. How long does it take for life to arise and how long does it take for it to evolve towards intelligence if that even happens very often? Um, but the, the other question I suppose would be is that, you know, we have what we see as a standard habitable zone where you can have liquid water on the surface of an exoplanet. But we have an awful lot of ice shell moons in this solar system that have oceans locked under ice. Do you think that the answer is probably lies more in our own solar system? In other words, looking at Europa or Enceladus for signs of microbial life to answer the question. Do you think that's that's going to be a more a better shot than than actually discovering it through a biosignature of an exoplanet? Yeah, I mean, I think if you can if you have an in situ detection of life, 
it's it's going to have far less uncertainty associated with it than a remote observation across tens of light years uh, of the cosmos. So that makes it very appealing. We've certainly you know attempted this strategy on Mars for a long time, although we haven't had hundreds of missions by any means, but we've had you know maybe a dozen or so missions which have had that somewhat related to their science goals to sort of investigate the possibilities of there being extant life um, on Mars. And it's, you know, it's still not ruled out, but I, I would say I'm more excited about the possibility of life in the solar system around one of these icy moons than I am around Mars. We've spent a lot of time looking at Mars. There's definitely nothing shouting or screaming at us there, unless it's very clever and it's, it's, it's missing all of our probes or something. But uh, I think the best possibility of something living in the solar system would probably be, as you say, something beneath the ice of Europa and Enceladus. Of course, that's a very challenging mission, very challenging mission to, to think about how to do that. If you drill into the ice and try and swim into the, into the water, you're going to contaminate it. It's almost impossible to completely sterilize a spacecraft that's put into space. So whatever you put into the surface, you're going to introduce life into that, into that potential biosphere. And thus, if you detect life, you might just be detecting the terrestrial life that hijacked a ride, or you may even um, damage the biosphere, which you're this very precious biosphere, potentially, the only other example in the solar system that you're interested in. So there's, uh, there's still a lot of um, details to be figured out there about how exactly would you make that kind of remote detection. Maybe the geysers would be the most interesting possibility. If life spewed out in a, in a geyser, then you don't actually have to interfere with the biosphere directly. You can just sort of collect the material and sample it from, from orbit. Um, so the Europa Clipper, uh, even though it's not directly looking for biology, I believe, uh, might get lucky and you know travel through a, a geyser if it's very fortunate, and that would give it an opportunity to maybe sample the ingredients of what's inside Europa. The nice thing there is that Europa is definitely spewing material out, and so is Enceladus, so eventually some sort of uh, direct admission to try to detect any organic chemistry or anything that's going on is still possible because they're just they're throwing it out there for us without having to actually drill into yeah. them or anything like that but there's always the problem too that if you do drill into there and you find life that is clearly related to earth then you have to start asking was it delivered there by a meteorite or something like that and you know you have this this disappointing situation where you drill into Europa and you find genetically related life instead of something that's truly independent of Earth, which I suppose is a big concern too. Uh, now, the, this idea of the ice shell moon, so to extend that out to exoplanets, one of the things you look for are exomoons. Do you expect that, just based on our sampling of our solar system, do you expect that these ice shell moons are everywhere in the Milky Way? I mean, that's the, that would be the Copernican perspective, right? To, to assume that the solar system is not unusual or in any particular way unless the, the components of our solar system should be found elsewhere throughout the cosmos. So I often say that when we look for exomoons, it's not a question of if they exist. It's just a question of where are they and what do they look like? What kind of properties do they have? We're pretty much 100% certain that moons have to be out there because you know, apart from Mercury and Venus, all of the planets have them. So it seems that they're a natural consequence of planet formation. Um, the exact properties of those moons, they may well indeed be icy, but we're only going to detect an icy moon if the planet itself is really cold. Because if the planet is at the right distance, for liquid water on its surface or closer in, then it's going to be difficult to maintain an icy moon. The, the moon would boil off, essentially. Um, so this is kind of actually one of the interesting calculations we've been thinking about doing here in our group is what would be the fate of Europa or Enceladus if Jupiter migrated inwards and was able to hold on to Europa? What would, what would happen to Europa? Would it turn into a big steam ball or would it, or would it slowly boil off? Um, you have kind of an ocean world, yet the surface gravity of that world is, is very low, and thus it doesn't seem possible for it to hold on to an atmosphere for a long period of time, especially a warm atmosphere. That's kind of an interesting thought experiment about what the fate of those moons would be. In terms of the types of planets we typically look at for exomoons, we want, of course, we would prefer to have planets like that. We would prefer to have planets similar to Jupiter, far away from their star, where we know, we know in the solar system there are plenty of moons. Unfortunately, those planets are very, very challenging to detect with the transit method just because of biases in the method itself. So it really struggles to find planets at wide separations. We have a handful, I'd say, of 
Kepler planets. Kepler looked for four years at the same stars, so that gives us a chance to find some longish period planets. We have a handful of planets which are just beyond the Habra zone, uh, or beyond the snow line, if you like, of their system, where not only icy moons are possible, but also icy rings. And uh, we're very interested in pursuing those with observatories like Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope, of course, when it comes online, to look for these signatures. And of course, we, we already think maybe we have something in, in, that, in that regard, although it's probably not exactly an icy moon in that case. Um, so there's, um, it's an ongoing program to try and find these things, and the properties of them remain unknown, yet I think it's quite reasonable to think that they, the types of moons we see in the solar system, at the bare minimum, should be elsewhere in the universe. Whether they represent the most common type, that's something we're hoping to find out. That was a bit of material that went over the edge. A bonus clip from a full episode of Event Horizon. New episodes every Thursday. So do be sure to hit subscribe. The full episode should be on your screen right about now. <laughs>